Hi, thank you, Miguel, for the introduction and sure. good evening, everybody. Uh, please confirm that you can see my screen and you can hear me OK. Yeah, everything is fine. Yes. OK, so it's my pleasure to be here today to give a talk about my favorite thing in the lab, which are extracellular vesicles, and to try to explain a little bit their, their roles and impact that they have uh, in different neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, this is a brief overview of how I organize the talk. First of all, I will start talking about extracellular vesicles uh, very briefly, just in case there's someone who is not familiar with, with them. Although these days I think they're very uh, known for, for everybody in the field. And I will continue with a big chunk of the talk, which, which is uh, the work that I've been doing on brain EVs, specifically from Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease uh, models. This is the work that I carried out in the laboratory for Fred Levy in, uh, in New York. And also I will uh, I will talk to you about the work that I was doing at the, at the laboratory of, of Parkinson's disease and movement disorders in Sao Paulo, which is a line uh, in Huntington's disease that I continue today uh, in Alicante. Finally, I will start talking about not EVs in the brain, but in the periphery and how we can find EVs that have a brain origin in, uh, in different biofluids such as uh, CSF, um, serous plana fluid or, or blood, and how can we use them to, to track brain pathology without having the need to go directly to the brain. So first of all, what are extracellular vesicles? This is the most recent definition that was given by the International Society of Extracellular Vesicles. This is, this is an, a new field. field. That is, then it's, it's a, sorry, it was, it's a, it's been in continuous development. So the, this, uh, this definition is just new. It has been uh, modified over the years. And uh, the newest definition says that are particles that are released from cells. They can be naturally or, or uh, modified by, by other system that are delimited by a lipid bilayer. And importantly, they cannot replicate on their own. This would di differentiate them from, for example, viruses. Uh, which are the main types of uh, the main types of EVs? We can differentiate them according to the subcellular origin. So we we can find uh, exosomes we derive with the from the endosomal system, the multiversicular bodies. And also we can find uh, ectosomes, which are also known as uh, microvesicles, but the newest um, MICEP guidelines recommend the term of ectosomes, but microvesicles are also very used. So we have the ones that come from the endosomes and the one that come from the plasma membrane. But these terms, exosomes or ectosomes, are not recommended to use if we don't really know the the origin in the cell of these vesicles. That's why it is recommended that we use the operation, operational terms that uh, of small extracellular vesicles, small EVs, that include exosomes and also ectosomes that are smaller than 200 nanometers. Exosomes would always be small. On the other hand, we can talk about large EVs if we are uh, referring to something bigger than 200 nanometers. I haven't included here, but there's also another type of EV, which I wouldn't go into because they are super big and it's, there's no much research on neurodegenerative diseases, which are the apoptotic bodies. They are usually a one, about one micron and they don't have a, a relevance for us when we are looking at the, when we're looking to study biomarkers. What about the EV composition or morphology? This is how uh, canonical EV would look like. They it would always have a lipid bilayer, which gives stability to the vesicles and is enriched of uh, cholesterol, ceramides, phosphatidylserin, and fisgomyelin. This, uh, this stability is keeping the, the content 
uh, protected from degradation. That's why they are good resources for biomarkers. Regarding the content, they will have the canonical, can, some canonical markers that we can use, some canonical proteins that we can use as markers for EVs. For example, in the lumen of the vesicles, we'll see, we'll find alix or, or TSG101, which are molecules related uh, with a role in the biogenesis of EVs. And also, if we focus on the membrane, we can see uh, the tetraspanins, which are very typical uh, uh, exosomal markers, which are the C63, C81, or CD9. In the membrane, we can also find other markers, such as annexin A1 or annexin A2, which are more related to ectosomes, so uh, EVs that are coming from the plasma membrane. What about the morphology? Well, the morphology that we can when we explore EVs by electron microscopy, by the traditional techniques of electron microscopy, we can see that EVs look like, remind us of uh, erythrocytes because they have, they have this uh, biconvex morphology. But we can see, but when we see them by cryo-electron microscopy, this is uh, with instant uh, uh, freezing of the vesicles without the need of compounds that fixate the, the vesicles such as uh, paraformaldehyde, we can see that these are completely spherical structures and we can also tell that they have this double uh, lipid membrane. What about their functions and properties? Well, originally EVs, uh, particularly exosomes, were thought, were thought to be the vehicles for the disposal of the unwanted molecules or, yeah, or debris that the cell didn't need anymore. But uh, over the years, it has been uh, reported and it has been demonstrated that EVs are not only waste carriers, but they, are, they have a function in the cell. So when an EV is released from one cell, it can be uptaken by other cells and, and change their biology. For example, EVs derived from lymphocytes uh, have been shown to stimulate responses in, the, in T cells. This is very important for immuno immunology. Also, the EVs can, can shuttle, can transfer cargo from one side to another, and this cargo can be very versatile. It can be from uh, molecules of RNA, DNA, proteins, lipids. And this is also an, an old publication when they were referring uh, to exosomes as fed exosomes, emphasizing their, av their ability to carry uh, different molecules. Also, one property that is very interesting about, the, about EVs is their immunological compatibility. They, are, they offer advantages uh, versus viruses or liposomes, uh, which are typical vehicles that have been used to uh, to deliver different therapeutic drugs. So there is another big line of research focused on, on a study the, the, the potential of EVs to carry drugs that can be therapeutic. So now I'm going to start talking why we are interested in studying EVs in neurodegenerative diseases. Well, first of all, because uh, if we focus on exosomes, which is the most studied type of EVs, the exosomes come from the endosomal pathway. And it is known that endosomal and lysosomal alterations are one of the earliest events that we can see in neurodegenerative diseases. Then we can expect, since exosomes come from endosomes, that there is uh, this interrelationship. I'm going to go through this drawing and explain to you how exosomes are formed so we can, we can get this idea. In the endosomal system, when the, when the plasma membrane invaginates, early endosomes are formed and they, as in, on, in their way to the nucleus, they mature to become multivesicular bodies. These are late endosomes that are called like that because this me the membrane of this organelle invaginates to form intraluminal vesicles. 
is when the membrane of the multivesicular body fuses with the plasma membrane when it releases and the interluminal vesicles that are called exosomes once they are inside the extracellular space. Alternatively, the multivesicular body can go to the lysosomes to degrade the content. That's why one of the first, uh, the first uh, functions that exosomes were given, the exosomal pathway was, was like they were like an alternative pathway to the lysosomal uh, pathway to degrade the compounds that the cell uh, couldn't like needed to digest. Well, what happens in uh, Alzheimer's disease on Down syndrome? We know uh, because of very, like very important publications from, from years ago from the group of Anne Cataldo and Ralph Nixon uh, in New York that when, when they described for the first time that there were uh, endosomal alterations in the brain first of Alzheimer's disease patients when they can see these alterations very early in the disease. If we see here, we can see how in neurons from, from brains, the endosomes are abnormal, are bigger. There are many of them compared to control brains. And this is even more robust when we look at Down syndrome. Down syndrome is the most common and it will be in humans caused by the trisomy of chromosome 21. And most of, the, of these, these patients will develop early onset Alzheimer's disease because of the triplication of the APP gene. So when we look at the endosomal alterations in, in these patients, we can see that we can observe them as early as 20, 28 weeks of gestation. This is in the fetal state. So the, the, gen, the genetic alterations are somehow causing these endosomal abnormalities, which occur very early, very, very early in life. And we can see these endosomal alterations also in mouse model specific of Down syndrome, um, like the case of the most model TS2, which derives from the most uh, known model, which is the TS65. Then in Down syndrome, the hypothesis that we have back in the lab in New York was like, there's uh, these endosomal alterations, there's, there's an accelerated uh, endocytosis in the cell, and maybe there's more exosomes being secreted in the, uh, to the to the outside, to the extracellular space, to alleviate uh, the cells from the from the extra accumulation of materials. Then the working hypothesis was: is this uh, beneficial? And the work the working hypothesis that we have in the lab it might be beneficial to alleviate the endosomal pathology. Then we wanted to investigate a dexosome secretory pathway and the molecular mechanisms that were underlaying the changes in exosome secretion in Down syndrome. But how do we study EVs? How do we study extracellular vesicles from the brain, from tissues? This was back in 2010 when there was a lot, some publications, not many because the field was new, about EVs from conditioned media and also some from body fluids, but uh, isolating EVs from tissues uh, is a challenging methodolo methodologically. So it was thanks to a, a Fundación Reina Sofía Mafre Fellowship that back in 2011, while I was a PhD student in the laboratory of Eva Caro, where I had the opportunity to go to New York, to the laboratory of uh, Blas Frangione and Efrat Levy, to start working with, with EVs, with exosomes, and we developed the first method to isolate the EVs from brain tissues. Then we use this method to isolate EVs from postmortem brain tissues from humans in the Down syndrome, the Down syndrome patients, and also from the, from the mouse model of the disease, TS2, and their deployed controls. And also as a as a in vitro approach to really verify the changes that were happening in, in vivo, we used human fibroblasts from Down syndrome patients. Then to give you a little bit of an overview of the method, the method was based on, on, on the method that was used to isolate primary primary neurons in culture. So the the basis of the method is to separate the cells in the brain in a way that you 
can release the extracellular space without uh, uh, breaking the integrity of the cells. You don't want the cells to break because otherwise they're going to have contamination from intracellular organelles and structures. Then to get that, we use papain, which is an enzyme that is going to break the, the connections in the extracellular space. It's a very mild treatment that we need to control very rigorously by time and, uh, and temperature to make sure that we don't, we don't get to break the cells. So the papain, after the papain treatment, we can pellet, which would be the cells that we get rid of them to follow with the next steps, which is based on first uh, low, low speed centrifugation to get rid of small debris. And then finally, a high speed centrifugation to pellet and wash uh, the, the EVs. But at this point, we have a pellet that is still uh, contaminated or or what, dirty with proteins that aggregate in the cell. When you are working with, with tissues, you should be more, more cautious with the, with the cleaning that you are doing with your preparation. That's why this pellet was put into a, a sucrose column. This is a gradient that is going to separate the, the, the protein aggregates from, from the vesicles. So when we perform, this is an overnight centrifugation at 200,000 G. We can isolate different fractions from the column uh, with another centrifugation. And we can see that we can uh, detect EVs that float in the densities that exosomes are supposed uh, to float. That are, uh, these are fractions P, C, and D. And we know that they are exosomes because they are immunoreactive for the markers, Alex, uh, the intraluminal that uh, marker that I was talking to you before, C63, this, the tetraspanning in the outside. And we also check uh, in that time floating in one, which now we know that it's not an exclusive marker of EVs, but we could see also uh, see the signal here. Um, we can see, we could see that the by electron microscopy analysis that the we could yell EVs and no cellular debris. And when we perform the nanotracking analysis, we could see that the most of the EVs that we were isolating had a size of around 100 nanometers on average, which is what is expected for, for small EVs. And further, if we perform proteomic analysis, uh, specifically gene ontology analysis, we could see that most of the proteins that were detected in our preparations, we related to extracellular vesicles and uh, exosomes. Then we isolated the EVs from, from post-mortem human brains of Down syndrome patients and also from the mouse models, different ages. And we could see that uh, there was an increase in uh, EV protein levels in both uh, the humans and also the mice. And in the case of the mice, we could see that the, this increase was, was significant at all the ages. So at 12 months of age, there will be an enhanced EV secretion. And when we look at what happened in the, in the cells, in the human fibroblasts, we observed the same results. In this case, there was more secretion of a total EV protein levels that we could also check by the levels, total levels of ALIX or TSC-101. But uh, we wonder after this level, is this increased level of a small EVs related to the increase in exosomes? Because we were really interested in, in analyzing exosomes to relate our findings, findings to endosomal pathology. In order to check that, we, we used the, the next approach. We took 12-month-old TS2 mice, the, the, the mouse model of Down syndrome, and we went to look at for those intraluminal vesicles inside the multivesicular bodies of the neurons. So you can see here two pictures of uh, electron microscopy, pictures of neurons from, from these mice. And uh, there's magnifications of the multivesicular bodies, where you can see the intraluminal vesicles inside. And also in the case of, of the TS2, where you can observe that there's more 
there the number of interluminal vesicles is higher. So we could see that there was a bigger number of multivesicular bodies in the neurons, that they were bigger, and they will also have a, a larger number of uh, interluminal vesicles per neuron, suggesting that the increase of EV secretion that we were seeing was most likely due to increase in this subpopulation of EVs, which are the exosomes. But what is the mechanism uh, behind this? We wanted to go further, and for that we we perform proteomic analysis of EVs isolated for from 12 month old uh, TS2 mice, and uh, we can we could uh, see that different proteins were were either overexpressed or underexpressed in in TS2 in these mice. But we were focused, very interested to see that C63, which is a transpanning, which also has a role in the in independent role in the biogenesis of, of, of exosome is not related to the biogenesis uh, to the same pathway that Alex and TSC101 are related to. So C63 was, was overexpressed. And we wanted to see what happened if we silent in vitro in our human Down syndrome fibrolas, if we knock down, if we decrease the amount of C63, by using silencing RNA. When we did that, what we observed is, is that the in the in the cells where C63 was knocked down, the endosomal pathology got worse, meaning that we could see bigger endosomes and also a bigger number, meaning that maybe um, exosome exosome release could have a protective role in the in Down syndrome, trying to to prevent from that the endosomal accumulation that we can see not only in vitro cells but also in the in the brains. Yes. So just to, to summarize what we have seen in, in Down syndrome, um, in Down syndrome we see that there's uh, an increased exosome release that we can take as, as a compensatory mechanism to limit the extent of the endosomal pathway pathology that is resulting from the, the genetic effect that we see in Down syndrome. Obviously, this compensatory, this compensatory mechanism is not enough because we see that the pathology is still there, but that at least the, the cell is trying to, to counteract the, the effect that is having the, the accelerated endocytosis that after that they also have lysosomal uh, and problems and, and problems related to autophagy. So next, um, we wanted to study the metabolism of APP in, uh, in EVs, specifically from, from Alzheimer's disease mouse models. Why? Because I've, I told you before that one of the reasons we study EVs in neurodegenerative diseases is because first, uh, endosomal alterations occur very early, and second, it has been known now for, for years that, that EVs carry, transport, they are rich in proteins that pathologically aggregate uh, during, during uh, neurodegeneration. And the first report that showed this was back in 2006, and this is a study with, uh, from Rajendran and collaborators with, where they could observe the presence of Alex, the typical uh, EV marker, in where the where the amyloid plaques were related, suggesting that maybe EVs could have a role in the propagation of, of amyloid beta. After that, many publications have shown how EVs are, are uh, contain the amyloid precursor protein, APP, their metabolites, their enzymes, and this has been seen in vitro and in our studies uh, in vivo. And also not only APP, but other proteins that they accumulate in other diseases such as alpha synuclein, tau, SOD, SOD1, TDP43. Uh, Newton Huntington still, uh, there are different uh, reports about it. It's not clear if, whether it is part of not or it is, 
but overall we can see that EVs might have a role in the the dynamics of these proteins that uh, are important for the for neurodegeneration and important targets too. Then we will focus on the, the amyloid precursor protein, APP. Uh, this is just uh, for you, but probably you all know, but APP is part of the plasma membrane and we can see that the APP CTFs will be in the interior, in the lumen part of, of a of plasma membrane, and if we look at the how APP will look in end in exosomes, if we follow the endosomal pathway, we can see that the orientation in the membrane in the plasma membrane is the the, the normal, but when it flips to enter the endos, endosome the endosomes, uh, it inverts the the orientation. But it flips again once it is in the multivesicular bodies. Then when when the when the exosomes are released, the APP that we see there it will be the same. It will have the same orientation that we see in this in the cells, in the plasma membrane. And this is how APP will look in a drawing in in a small EV. Therefore, we wanted to study APP in EVs. For that, uh, we use uh, the C16.1 antibody, which recognizes both full length APP and APP CTFs. And we tried in uh, in the T in EVs isolated from the T2576 mouse model of Alzheimer's disease and compare it uh, with the uh, wild type. Also, we use the 6 e 10 antibody, which detects uh, A beta. And we can see that we could we could identify A beta, but a very small fraction in, in EVs isolated for, from T2576. So the most uh, the most impacting result was that uh, APP was in EVs, and we could see mainly APP CTFs compared to the to the rest of the brain. So there was an enrichment of APP CTFs, which can be uh, toxic, especially beta CTF in EVs. And we have consistently seen that this happens in all the systems that we have explored. This is the case of uh, Down syndrome in uh, human brains. These are the cell lysates. And we can see that here is full length APP and the amount of APP CTFs from is very low. And we can we only detect it in the in Down syndrome patients and not in the deployed controls. But we, when we move to EVs, we can see that this ratio in, inverts, and uh, we can see larger uh, amounts of APCTFs compared to full APP. And we have seen this also in vitro, and this is the case for human fibrillas from Down syndrome patients, where we could barely detect that actually we don't see full APP by Western blood, but we can see this enrichment in APCTFs. Again, and this also happens in a, in a neuronal <coughs> sorry in a neuronal model of of, of a cell line the SH SY five Y cells where we can see again this ratio. So this is very consistent. But not only we can see APP and the APP CTS metabolites, we we could also see that brain levies contain all the enzymatic machinery that is needed to cleft APP. Uh, this is uh, our results for brain EVs, uh, yes, wild type mice. Uh, we could see the same in vitro when we explore the SHSY5Y cells. And um, uh, in fact, when we do the analysis in vitro, we can see that base one and uh, adantem, specifically the mature form, are are enriched in EVs, in EVs compared uh, to, to, the, to the cell like, like it, uh, suggesting that EVs might have a role in the, in the generation of the cleavage or the metabolism of APP uh, once they are outside the, the cell. So we wanted to, to verify that. Um, what we did was to isolate EVs from from this, in the case of wild type mice. And we put them in vitro, just in this isolated at different time points. 
24, 48, and 72 hours, and we could see how uh, we were able to see an increased generation of APP CTLs, alpha and beta. And we did the same with the uh, with young TG2576 mice, um, we compared the test to the knockout to, to verify the, the specificity of the signals. We could see the same, that there was an increase of, uh, of APPCTF over time, suggesting the, the activity, that the, the intrinsic activity to cleavage APP that is inside the ABC. But what about A beta? I have shown you before that the beta, the levels of A beta were very small in the, in EVs. So we wanted to happen if we the same treatment, if we put this EVs isolated from the brain in vitro at, at 37 degrees, what happened with the beta? And if you pay attention in this blood, you can see how after 24 hours we could see in zero point, we could see monomers, uh, the monomeric forms of A beta that disappear over time. And instead, in turn, we have an increase in the oligomeric uh, forms of A beta. Specifically, we could see an increase in the levels of the dimers. Therefore, just to summarize this part of on, on APP, in mostly in, in the mouse model of Alzheimer's disease TB2576, uh, we have seen that EVs are enriched in APPCTFs compared to cell lysets, that APP can be proteolytically cleaved to generate uh, um, more APPCTFs over time, that uh, unlike APPCTFs, uh, A beta is not generated uh, de novo in EVs. What we have seen is like uh, A beta is able to oligomerize once it is in the surface of EVs. And uh, therefore, we can conclude that EVs might not be a major source for A beta generation, but uh, they can serve at the seeding point for the oligomeric forms of E beta, which are known to be toxic, and potentially also for the fibrillar forms. Therefore, we need to consider the two possible roles of EVs. Uh, for one side, it would be the secretion of EVs would be beneficial for the cell because it would release the neurotoxic APPCTFs and Iveta from the cell, and also, as I mentioned before, alleviating the endosomal pathology. But it's gonna, the EV that's going to be released is going probably to another cell, and it's going to propagate, uh, or even in the extracellular spacing, it's going to propagate the pathology, it's going to propagate the the neurotoxicity of uh, these APP metabolisms, and also it might serve as a seeding point of amyloid. Then I'm going to continue talking about uh, my last project uh, about Huntington disease that I continue today. Huntington disease, uh, as all you might know, is an inherited autosomal dominant disease that is characterized by progressive degeneration of the striatum and cerebral cortex, and is caused by the mutation of the H, uh, Huntington gene, which comprises an aberrant exp expansion of a CAG repeat. It is known there are vesicular trafficking alterations in the neurons from, uh, from Huntington disease uh, models, and specifically um, in HD models, uh, endosomal anomalies have been found. And also, it's it's more it has been more recently known that the mutant Huntington accumulates in the endosomal compartments, and it might alter the endosomal and lysosomal trafficking. Uh, as I was saying before, back back to the relationship between the endosomal and exosomal system. Then, when we what we wanted to study, and uh, as uh, we were lucky to be to get funds from the European Huntington Disease Network, we wanted to study the levels and content. Uh, of uh, of of uh, EVs isolated from HD uh, brains uh, were different, and also if we could identify some EV associated biomarkers that could be related with the mutant uh, with the mutation of of hunting. Then uh, for that we used the uh, postmortem brain tissues from that we. We requested to to the biobank of e, of Edivax, 
from EDVAPS in Barcelona. And we wanted to explore both areas that are involved in the pathology of Huntington disease, as triatum and cortex. And also we were lucky to request uh, different uh, uh, brains from in two different stages of the, of the pathology. Early von Sattel stages, which means uh, early von Sattel, it refers to the to the striatal neuron, neuronal loss and strogliosis focusing the in the in the striate. So it's a uh, early degeneration for uh, von Sattel stages one two or late degeneration for von Sattel stages uh, three four. So we have these three experimental groups that we wanted to. To explore. So for that, we use the method that I, I mentioned before, but in this case, we used an optimization of the, of the method that have been more recently published, where instead of a cross column, we used an eodixanol, um, mostly known as OptiPrep, eodixanol gradient in order to be able to go further and differentiate different subpopulations in this. So the method is basically the same, but we have different fractions. So we were interested in two fractions, uh, that were a pool of two fractions, the low density fractions that were fractions one to three, uh, that might correspond more to ectosomes or microvesicles coming from the plasma membrane, and the fractions, uh, the pool of fractions from four to seven that are more exosome fractions. We check these fractions by cryoelectron microscopy, and uh, also by Western blood. And we can see that the, we can see, we could see, for example, in the, the, the lower density fraction, how an exine A2, a marker of ectosomes, is more represented. And in the case of the other, uh, the other fractions, we can see Alex and DSE11. Also, in terms of purity, we check the particle to protein ratio to see that we were, we were not really having a protein. Uh, contamination in our EV preparations and the ratios were very good, uh, reassuring the, the purity. What happened when we analyzed these, these fractions? By we use nanoparticle tracking analysis to check the number and the size of the of the vesicles, and uh, we did that did that for the two for the two fractions. The most interesting result was like a the number of EVs that were positive for Alex, a common exosomal marker, were decreased in Huntington disease uh, EVs. And this happened uh, in the earliest stages of the pathology and also in the latest. And we checked this in the estriatum tune and also in the cortex. Uh, in the cortex, I'm not gonna show you the data, but we see the same, but uh, it's less, uh, the results are not robust, as robust. So the summary of where we explored when we checked estriatum and cortex in these different uh, brains from different stages of neural degeneration, like when we checked the Alex positive EVs, the fraction that might correspond to exosomes, we see that there is a decrease that uh, relates with the state of degeneration in the brain. But when we checked annexing two positive EVs related to ectos ectosomes, we see that there is an increase in the cortex early in the disease, and then there's a tendency to decrease, but it's not as striking as what happens with the small EVs uh, enriched with Alex. We were very interested in Alex because the results were very striking, and all the results that I presented now, we, I focus in the, all the results are normalizing by, by brain weight because we are studying in secretion. What is the number of EVs that are released? Now we want us to study, to check uh, how, the, how many molecules of Alex were per EV. For that, we normalize the total levels of Alex by the number of EV protein in the EVs. And we got to see that the levels of Alex per EV were also lower in Huntington disease. And, and this happened in the striatum on the cortex. So this uh, uh, brought us to study what is the what are the levels of Alex in the brain? This typical exosomal marker. And we could see that the the normal levels, the levels of Alex in the in the total in total brain homogenates. This is the case of estriatum, would decrease uh, in Huntington disease, and the decrease was more robust when we were considering uh, later stages of the pathology. 
Uh, also, very interestingly, we could see that the, the levels of allylates correlated with the von Sattel stage. So the, the lower the levels of allylates, the more the, the, the generation. Um, we used also as an in vitro approach, uh, in Huntington disease fibrolasts, and that we put in vitro and collected EVs. This is ultra centrifugation. And we could see the same, that the, the, uh, there was a decrease in the number of EVs that were positive for Alex. And we like this model because in this case, we don't have interference from, from the brain because from the brain we have seen that the levels of Alex also decrease in total, in total homogenates. In the case of fibrolas, we see that the levels of Alex do not change. Therefore, in this case, the, the changes of Alex are specific to the EVs that are secreted to the, to the condition median this time, in this case. And as comparison, when we look at an XNA2, the levels of uh, the marker for other type of vesicles, we, did, we didn't see the changes. So these changes were specific for the Alex positive, positive EVs. And then as a summary of, uh, of, uh, of uh, what I have told you before, it's like if subpopulation and rigid Alex, which most likely can be exosomes, is reduced in HDE3A2 compared to controls. That there is an altered cargo of Alex, less molecules of Alex in EVs, and this was consistent with a decrease in Alex protein levels in the uh, Huntington diseases 3A2 and cortex that correlates with the uh, neuropathology. And in vitro, we have seen that the uh, fibrolar secret less, less Alex in rich EVs despite having similar levels of Alex at the cell lysic level. And overall, we can conclude that there's a, this data might reveal new insight for, into the pathophysiology of brain EVs in, in Huntington disease, and have identified Alex as a novel myomark, biomarker for, of uh, neuropathology in the disease. Then we were wondering after seeing this, these results, what happens with uh, Alex in biofluids? Uh, from Huntington disease mutation carriers. And I'm not going to give you an answer today, but this is an ongoing project that is uh, taking place uh, in Sao Paulo. And they're analyzing the, the levels of Alex in a cohort, in this case, cross-sectional, but that the studies are moving also to a longitudinal study. And we, we are first looking at the levels of Alex uh, soluble, and then we plan to look at the levels of Alex specifically uh, in EVs. And uh, we still are, are collaborating, and this this is led by Anna Batket, also Neil Salvat and Elisa Rivas, that are in, in working in San Paulo. Uh, then this is the, the last part of, of my talk where I'm gonna move from the brain uh, to the periphery. And uh, because this is where where the clinics uh, were the most interested interesting findings of, of EVs uh, might, uh, might be for, for the translational research and also for the clinics, for moving the results of uh, in terms of biomarkers uh, to the clinics without the need of going to the, actually to the brain. Then we know that in the central nervous system, all the cells uh, release uh, EVs. Uh, they are released by neurons, astrocytes, microglia, and oligodendroglia, and we know for a while now that we can find also EVs in the ciliary spinal fluid. And also that EVs that are generated in the brain cells can reach the, the bloodstream. This last uh, part uh, is manifesting that if we have EVs with a brain origin in the periphery, we can use them as a, as a window to the brain. We don't need to actually go to the brain. We can just isolate this specific type of EVs uh, to get insights on the pathological states uh, of, of the cells in the brain. So what we know that the EVs, EVs get to the bloodstream, to the periphery, but, but we don't know exactly how, is how they get there. We know that they transfer, they transport, they, they cross the blood-brain barrier. This is the, the most uh, known uh, pathway for the EVs to get from the brain to the, the blood. And the blood-brain barrier, as all you know, is, is, is uh, 
is made of epithelial uh, cells, pericytes, and also astrocytes. And the, the mechanisms are not known. We know that there's some type of transcytosis. This is the EV going through entering the endothelial cells and then exiting the, the endothelial cells, but there are only uh, reports showing this uh, in vitro and also in vivo in several fields, but there's there's no proof still in mammals that this happens. Another pathway for EVs to reach uh, to reach blood is through the CSF barrier, and this would be this is this would be through the colloid plexus cells. So probably what we see in the CSF, it can expect it can be expected to be seen in the in the blood uh, through this pathway. And more recently, a new pathway has been reported, which is the one related to the lymphatic pathway and the communication to the CSF and brain barrier. So this we might also consider in the future. We, there's no reports about EVs um, specifically from this pathway, but this uh, might be something that probably we see mean results uh, moving forward of uh, an alternative pathway of the EVs to get to the to blood. And well, regardless how they how they get to the blood, we know that they are there. And we are interested in studying blood because blood is easily accessible and it's a very uh, convenient source of biomarkers. We can also do longitudinal studies with several several extractions on blood. It's minimally invasive. And it has been is well established right now as a biofluid in diagnostics uh, for some diseases, and also it's a valuable source of of EVs. However, if we look at the if we want to find brain derived EVs in a, in the blood, we can see these are in silica studies, computational studies. We can see that the amount, the percentage of brain EVs that are present in blood is very, very, very low, as low as 2.2% uh, of the EVs that we can find in, in blood. This is a very low percentage. That's why the, methodolo the methodology that we use to isolate them has, been, has to be very sensitive and, and very critical. But as you can see here, most of the EVs that we find in plasma comes from the cells that are actually in, in blood which are the platelets, which is number one in secreting B cells, T cells, uh, red cells, and monocytes. And regarding the EVs that come from tissues, uh, from most, uh, most of the EVs come from the adipose tissue and then from muscles and then lung, liver, and in the back we have the brain. So it's a very small uh, amount of EVs. On top of that, we have other challenges when we isolate EVs from blood, which is that they have a, blood is very rich in proteins that they are going to interfere in our isolation methods. And another problem is that the lipoproteins that have similar size of uh, EVs and might also be part of our EV preparations when we isolate. So the two methods that are mostly used uh, to isolate EVs from blood are Ultracentrifugation, with it's a series of centrifugations that finish with uh, ultracentrifugation at 100,000 J, uh, generally. And also we have the size exclusion chromatography, which is better uh, for, for some applications when, we, when you need intact EVs and you prevent from aggregation of EVs once you isolate. So what are the advantages of EVs, isolating EVs from blood? It's like it's a, we can get a larger volumes of blood, of plasma or serum. We will get a decent gel of EVs to work with. And about the disadvantages, we can see that if we focus on EVs from the brain, we are going to have a lot of uh, EVs coming from other tissues, including the blood, and we need a further enrichment uh, and further another method to enrich in the specific EVs. On the other hand, CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, is, an, is another biofluid that uh, we can explore for EVs. Uh, but in this case, um, uh, it's more interesting in the sense that it's more related to the to the brain, where we are going to find in the 
in the CSF, but we are going to have low EV yields. Uh, CSF, you need a lot of volume of CSF to get a decent uh, yield of, of EVs to work with. And this is a challenge. Also, this is a very precious, precious liquid uh, biofluid that uh, you need an, inv an invasive uh, procedure to get the to extract the CSF, Lambert puncture. So it's a serious technique that they cannot be cannot be planned to do, uh, for example, for for a follow up of a patient in a in a longitudinal longitudinal studies. So this is an, an example how we can successfully isolate EVs from ultra centrifugation, which is a, which is an okay method to do that. There's some also reports that have used SEC size exclusion chromatography, but in this case, the number is so low that you really need to concentrate the, the fractions afterwards and uh, use very sensitive techniques like SIMOA or, or other uh, ultra-sensitive ELISAs to get, the, to get a readout of your specific analy uh, analytes that you are studying. Then in the case, if we focus on blood, which is where we are most interested in, we have to isolate total EVs, we call them bulk EVs, and then go to a specific population of populations of EVs that come from the brain. Uh, different uh, surface markers have been reported to isolate, uh, for example, in the case in, of neuronal EVs, L1CAM has been the most uh, used. You can find now many uh, papers in the literature where they have used this, this marker to specifically pull out the population specific from, from neurons, although it has been controvert, controverted because uh, it seems that L1CAM is also is not specific from, from brain, the L1CAM that you find in blood. But uh, I mean, there's a, so that's why L1CAM right now uh, is being uh, People are looking for new markers, uh, and this is the case, for example, of ATP one A three that has been recently reported. And um, in the case of astrocyte CVs, we have different markers have been used, like a uh, class uh, this is AXA one or EA eighty two, and also we are exploring in the lab the deficiency of uh, GPM six A as a novel marker for astrocytic uh, EVs. And uh, also in the case of oligodendritic DVs, people have been using the the mock protein. Uh, just uh, we are now working very active, actively in the lab, trying to to optimize the methodology to use uh, different markers, uh, specifically ATP one and three. is giving is giving us uh, good results in when we explore EV populations in the brain, and also now we are moving to to CSF and, and blood. And we are using this, uh, this methodology to explore different brain EV subpopulations, not only related to the subcellular origin of, of the EVs, as I was mentioning to you earlier, but also to try to pull out the different uh, populations according to the cell origin. And uh, this is just uh, two projects that we have just started trying to figure trying to get insights of the different uh, populations, first optimizing methodology and then going going to explore the content of our proteins for these first projects. And this is a European project when they are we are more focused in the in the non-coding RNAs, which are also as a fundamental part of, of EVs that can be considered as biomarkers. I then uh, this I'm going to finalize my talk, just trying to give you a few take home messages um, regarding of what I've just told you. Um, to start like exploring EVs in the brain can offer insights on the pathophysiology of some neurodegenerative diseases, as I have shown you for Down syndrome or Huntington disease, uh, for example. That EVs contain materials that are specific of the cell of origin. And uh, this is important for us because they can give us information about the state of the cells. The DVs in biofluids have grain potentials as surrogate markers for brain pathological processes. But there's uh, a lot of methodological challenges that we need to address, and there is a need for standardized 
standardization of, of protocols that we cannot use if we are thinking about the translation to the clinics. And uh, finally, the identification of key proteins in, in brain EVs that we can find in the periphery can allow the development of uh, non-invasive diagnostic tools uh, where we could assess the brain pathology in diseases of the nervous in of the nervous uh, center uh, system without the need to go in actually to the brain and being complementary to other techniques such as uh, imaging of the brain, uh, MRI and uh, and other bio, uh, biomarkers that, for example, for, for Alzheimer's disease, we all know that they, we, they are being very, very useful now in CSF and they are also going, moving their way to the blood. So, yes, I, was, I will finalize with the acknowledgement. Uh, this work was done uh, uh, mostly in the Fats Levy Laboratory in New York. So, I would like to thank all my co workers there. It was a great time. Uh, then uh, I went to Spain. Um, my first uh, site was uh, Barcelona as part of the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorders Laboratory, uh, led by Jaime Kulisevsky, where I performed uh, my work on Huntington's disease. Uh, and, and I would like to thank also all my co-workers there. And um, finally, all my co-workers in, uh, in my current lab, which is in Alicante, in the as part of Isabel and the Instituto de Neurociencias. Of course, the funding, uh, the funding, especially my new Servet, which uh, with, uh, through which I am able to start my, my own lines of research. And yes, thank you for, for your attention. Now we'll be happy to, to hear questions from you. All right, thank you very much, Rocio, for a very 